So at this point in the story, we have two plot threads both happening at the same time. They're both very important, but unrelated to one another. For the purpose of letting this video flow better, I'm just going to show one at a time, rather than bouncing back and forth like the game does. Of course, this video has an order to the stories, but you can always choose to watch a different one first. Here are the timestamps for both chapters. The leaders of Eorzea have dealt with the threats of the land for years, but there's one person who knows it far better than they ever could. A young, wealthy boy from a far-off island nation of scholars. That's right, Alphano Levier. The Crystal Braves is the brainchild of Alphano, a fourth option to the eternal question of the Grand Companies. Through this fetching new group, he seeks to unite the realm and keep the peace where one warrior of light could not. To that end, we help him recruit a few people familiar and new alike. Would you please sign my petition? Hi there, would you like to sign my petition? Look, just sign the stupid petition. I've got stuff to do. At the head of this group is a man named Ilbert. After establishing its foundation, the group is ready for its very first mission. The Immortal Flames are the military force of Ulda, led by General Rabon. Though they were a great power at certain points, they now mostly rely upon mercenaries to act as soldiers for them. Of course, with any group reliant on cell swords, there's a traitor in their midst. And the Crystal Braves will be the one to find them. They have a funny code name, too. The Ivy. After a good deal of digging, Ilbert comes to the conclusion that the traitor must be in the upper echelon of the Flames' leadership. This fact is made even rougher by the news that Garlevald is no longer embroiled in its war of succession. A new emperor has been crowned, Verisia Galvis, now Verisil Galvis, and this dude really wants to conquer Eorzea. After doubling down on his search, Ilbert discovers the traitor to be Flame Marshal Elin Royal. Elin Roy. Elin Waya. Elin Roy. Elin Ayaba. The second in command of the Immortal Flames, a saboteur for the Garlean Empire, and an informant for the Monitorist faction of Uldah. Being the Warrior of Light, it's a simple thing to track her down into the woods and place her under arrest, especially so with the help of some strong friends. Bad news, guys. Elin has escaped capture, and it's our job to go get her back. In this one, if you let Ilbert die, you fail. And just for the record, don't pay attention to her health bar, you can't actually kill her. You have to take on every single wave of Garlean soldiers. As long as you stick to that, it's not half bad, but it can get a little dicey. Oh my god, that was so close. After catching her again, we meet back up with Rabon, and after we leave, he makes his feelings about the ruling class known to any listeners hiding away. All these years, I've been made to dance to their tune. How could you, Huayu? How could you side with them? Those cankers who take from this land and give naught in return, who use their power to disempower and grow fat while the people starve. I know you can hear me, monitor and scum. Your crimes will not go unpunished. One day I will purge this land of your sickness before the eyes of the Twelve. I swear it. The true wealth of Uldar lies in the health, happiness, and hopes of her citizens. Alas, the citizens shall never know these things, so long as their lives are ruled by the ambitions of the few. For the government to serve the people, it must be formed of the people. As the last monarch in the line of Ul, I make unto you this request. Help Roban to preserve order, and protect the people. Forsake them, and you forsake yourselves, for a strong Eorzea will ever have need of a strong Ulda. When the time is ripe, the nation shall become a true republic. Both royalists and monetarists shall cease to be. In the icy lands of Karthus, trouble always lingers about. Those proclaimed heretics by Ishgard have always been responsible for a great deal of mischief but now it's spread beyond the borders of the Holy See. For a short time, the Ishgardians have been sending carriages of supplies to the developing town of Revenant's Toll. 
and as it happens, the heretics have taken it upon themselves to attack one such carriage. Thus the Warrior of Light, hey, that's me, has been called to action to find the perpetrators of this attack and to put them to justice. We start our quest by meeting with our friend Harshafant. He is, of course, slightly disappointed that we've come to resolve some local strife, rather than stay at his side while we drink away the hours. Whoa. He sends us off to wipe from front with well wishes, where we once again meet with Lord Trillamont of House Turandere. The heretic's leader, Iceheart, has sparked some kind of change within them, driving them into the depths of their zeal. We question a merchant who was attacked, and he tells us that he heard mention of Snowcloak, an area to the west. We encounter our fair share of heretics on the path, but eventually make it to our destination. There we catch a glimpse of her, Lady Iceheart, the leader of the heretics. With that, we learn that the heretics are almost certainly hiding away in tunnels within Snowcloak. After a time, we're invited to speak with the Lord Commander of the Temple Knights of Ishgard, Sir Emmerich. This is highly unusual since Ishgard has been politically isolated for over a decade. Alphano believes that this may be a golden opportunity to bring them back into the fold of the Eorzean Alliance, a collective that Ishgard abandoned quite some time ago. Emric makes it very clear that he does not fear the Ixal nor the Garleans. He isn't presently worried about any threat to his nation, save for the dragons and their followers. He has a request for us, and as a reward, he would make certain the shipments to Mordona continue without opposition. He wishes for us to keep an eye on the corpse of the Great Worm Midgard Zormer, the Keeper of the Lake. After agreements have been reached, a knight delivers news that another caravan was attacked, once again by Iceheart. A caravan hauling a vast quantity of crystals, attacked by heretics who spoke of salvation, and Shiva. Who is Shiva, you might ask? According to Ishgardian tradition, dragons and men are mortal foes, destined to clash with one another for all of time. Shiva is considered to be a traitor to her people. She fell in love with a dragon. And, well, you see, when a dragon and a woman love each other very, very much, they... No. No, 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 no. No. You're way too young for this. And do dragons even have lips? Alphano believes rightly that these heretics intend to summon Shiva as a primal, using the stolen crystals. And so, we hightail it to Snowcloak to prevent them from getting any further along in their plans. Another day, another dungeon with my robot buddies. The first boss is nothing new. You've seen Circle AoAs. It's more of the same, and the occasional Ring of Death. Now the second boss is where we start to get into the real stuff. Right, so four snowballs drop down. One gets sized up. Can you guess what happens? Just walk away from the big one to avoid the bigger circle it puts out, and you're good. Pretty simple mechanic. This is the classic double trouble double whammy move bosses love. Out, in, and then spread, too. Pretty fun. But oh, wait a minute, hold on. Can you handle two enlarged snowballs? Yeah, probably. Overall, this boss isn't too bad. Okay, here's the real boss of this dungeon. Final Fantasy XIV players will remember this boss well. If you have friends who play this game, there's a good chance they'll have horror stories about this guy. Back in the day, he'd obliterate parties who couldn't keep up with his mechanics. To summarize, crystals come down, big AoE pulses out, stand behind crystals to avoid getting hit by AoE. In the olden times, this move would one-shot you if you didn't take cover. After the AoE goes off, you just have to move away from the crystals. Okay, you think you're so cool? Try this one. Can you spot the difference? One crystal is safe, the rest are cracked. Only one actually works as shelter. Alright, another dungeon down. At the end of the path, we once again meet with Lady Iceheart. She scolds us for perpetuating the war between dragons and men, stating that in time, we will understand her reasons. 
She escapes through an aetherite, destroying the one on the other end to cut off our pursuit. To get any further, we'll need someone well versed in aetherites. A friend of the Zions is coming all the way from Charlene to help with our little problem. Her name is Mimbrita Wilson Wen. She's a prominent figure in the field of aetherology. Charmed, I'm sure. Moon! Gods, it's been ages! Oh, longer, sister! A joyous reunion indeed. Well, of course it is! Moon and I are like twin sisters. Save in appearance and aptitude. <laughs> Turns out she has a history with her hair. Hey. Oriange, where in the hells have you been hiding? Uh, unhand me. I much preferred when you were pleading with me to drop everything and hurry to your side. What was it you said? None save thee can satisfy this need. Go on. They're friends. She's been researching into White Orse, and I promise you we will get to White Orse. But for now, all that matters is that it can be used to help us. Basically, the White Orse will be used to channel Aether to temporarily reconstruct the flow of Aether to where Isar fled. This will allow us to get in and stop her. It's not exactly a guarantee. There's a decent chance we die in the process, but everything else has been a gamble so far, so let's go for it. Okay. Alright, now we wait. <laughs> we just wait here in Limsa. Let's give it a shot. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited! You should never have come here, Warrior of Light. I labor only to forge a lasting peace. A peace you would deny us out of ignorance and blind faith. No matter. If it is our fate to be at odds, then it is mine to strike you down. We whom gods and men have forsaken shall be the instruments of our own deliverance. Vessel with your light. Walk amongst your brothers and sisters once more. Oh, Saint Shiva, still the hatred within our hearts and bless us with eternal grace. A lot of the mechanics in this fight are simple things, like spreading and avoiding AoEs. Now, I will say that some of the AoEs are a little bit more messed up than your usual ones. This is the AoE pattern you'll be dealing with to start. They can be a tiny bit rough to avoid. Halfway through, Shiva will summon four adds. Kill them, and you're off to the second phase. Now this is where we're first introduced to an AoE type that we'll see several more times across our adventure. It's a kind of staggered loop. AoEs go round and round in a circle, going off in the order in which they appeared. The basic strategy to solve these is to stand at the last one to appear, moving into the first one after that one goes off. Even in normal gameplay, but especially when you're forced to walk, you have to be incredibly comfortable maneuvering around AoEs that are already on the ground. Do you recall what happened with Rama, where standing in front of the boss led to my demise? That's a common theme in this, and it's way worse this time. Shiva's cleave is a very wide cone. If you're in front of her when she does this, you're probably dead, in all likelihood. So the trick, of course, is to make sure that you're always behind her, except in situations where you absolutely have to be in front of her. Past that, it just comes down to grinding it out. Circle, 
Oh no, I'm not gonna be able to make it, am I? Just pick one and stand. Oh. Oh, oh my god. god. This fight is so scary. My heart. What the hell? Oh my god. Oh my god. You, of all people, should understand the suffering war begets. That no sacrifice is too great if it brings an end to the violence. Seek the Keeper of the Lake. See, with eyes unclouded, do not squander Mother's gift. Hear, feel, think. Another primal has been defeated, but this time it's left a bitter taste. And so the vessel withdraws. A predictable outcome. Nevertheless, La Habrea will be pleased. How unfortunate. Parshavant was, to put it lightly, worried sick about us charging off alone to face Shiva. For the time being, our business in Karthus is concluded. Shipments to Revenant's Toll will begin once again. It's a certain thing that as Heidelin speaks to us, Vinfilia, and others, so too does she speak to Iceheart. She's been blessed with the gift of the Echo, like us. The Scions scatter around Eorzea once again to begin researching into the thing we need most, the method for slaying an Asian. After a time, we're visited by Lucia, Emmerich's second-in-command. The Dragon Star, a star in the sky representing the dragons, has been brighter as of late. The astrologians of Ishgard believe this to be a sign of a potential renewed attack from the dragons. So we're sent to go examine the Keeper of Silvertail Lake, Midgard Sormer. Midgard Sormer was a great and powerful dragon. Fifteen years ago, the Garleans sent out their largest ship to conquer Eorzea. However, when they passed through Silvertear Falls, they were met by Midgard Sormer, and their ship was felled, at the cost of the Great Worm's life. Their clash was so great that the falls were reduced to a small lake, now Silvertear Lake. So our task is to climb up the rubble of the Garleans ship, Agrius, and around the corpse of the Great Worm. Sounds simple enough. Here it is, the last dungeon of A Realm Reborn. I got a little eager starting out, and kind of got overwhelmed by ads. My mistake for trying to go fast in this challenge. This first boss drops a bunch of Ceruleum tanks. A line comes out hitting two of them, these two detonate first, and soon after the rest will detonate too. This was my first time doing the dungeon since its changes in 6.2, so I wasn't aware of what to look out for. You can see here that even when I figured it out, getting away from the tanks was a little tough for me at my speed. This second boss loves fire. The basic thing to remember here is that if the boss moves off to one side of the arena, it's soon going to point itself in a direction. Once you see it line itself up in a direction, move away from its path. It leaps behind these big circles of fire as it moves across the arena. You're given a huge amount of time, so this isn't a big deal. Besides some ads, everything else is very simple here. After making it to the top, we're confronted by a very unexpected sight.
At the very top of the remnants of the Agrius, we now fight against the spectral visage of the Great Worm Midgard Zormer himself. Midgard Zormer has a crazy amount of huge, sweeping AoEs, ones that hurt a lot if you get hit by them, but rather than bog you down with mechanics, I want you to just enjoy the spectacle of this. By her gifts hast thou earned a moment's reprieve. My people have heard the song. Ishgard shall burn. Sons must answer for their father's misdeeds. Thou art powerless to silence us, mortal. Yet thou shalt not live to labor in vain. This frail, noble creature is not gifted, but chosen. Hearken to me, Hydalin. I remember, and I consent. in the sense of, like, relativistically speaking, the way that we see lips as human beings. You know, like, how we can form suction with our lips? Kind of like how horses can. You know, they can dip their mouths into the troughs and form suction with their lips to drink the water. Something kind of akin to that. Do dragons 